At the American Enterprise Institute, we are very partial to free markets and very partial to free Iraq. So we are particularly delighted that Adil Abdul Mahdi, the finance minister of the Iraqi interim government, who was in Washington this week for the IMF World Bank meetings, would come here this morning to report on developments in his nation's economic and financial reconstruction. In America, we sometimes think that we invented the marketplace, but its origins, in fact, go back to the land of the Tigris and the Euphrates. The Iraqis are great commercial and entrepreneurial people, and although Minister Mahdi's portfolio has understandably been receiving less attention in the Western press than immediate security challenges in recent months, in fact, his work is central to the aspirations of his countrymen to build a free and prosperous nation once again. And he is uh, uh, using the week, and his remarks will be devoted to the negotiations uh, that he is taking uh, part in this week, uh, not only with uh, individuals in the officials of the American government, uh, but uh, at the World Bank and IMF, and through them, uh, the nations of, uh, of Europe. Minister Mahdi is a prominent member of Iraqi's Shia community. As a young man, he was a political dissenter and activist. He spent most of the years of Saddam Hussein's rule in exile in France, uh, where he studied politics and economics, became head of the French Institute for Islamic Studies, and edited several magazines in Arabic and French. He has become increasingly prominent in Iraqi politics over the last 18 months and exemplifies the calm, steady, and brave leadership uh, that uh, is the great hope for the future of his nation. We're very glad that he would come to AEI during his busy week in Washington. He will uh, offer remarks and uh, take uh, questions. The question period will be moderated by my colleague, Danielle Pletka. Please give a very warm welcome to Minister Adil Abdul Mahdi. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, when I told uh, my people I am going to the American Institute, they told me they are tough. They are tough guys, so be careful. <laughs> I will be careful, and uh, I will be open later on to any question. It's really an honor for me and a pleasure uh, to address the American Enterprise Institute. Today marks nearly the end point of a very busy and fruitful week for Iraq's delegation to the annual meetings of the World Bank and International Monetary Fund. This week has afforded to me and other members of the Iraqi delegation the opportunity to renew contacts with old friends, both individual and institutional, and to make new ones. It was my privilege this week to take up the role of Iraq's governor to the World Bank and participate in the deliberations of that institution. And I was pleased when my colleague, Central Bank Governor, Dr. Shibibi, assumed the role of Iraq's governor to the fund. As you know, official relations between Iraq and the international financial institutions were interrupted for more than two decades. So I was proud for my country that this week, Iraq took additional and important steps towards full reintegration in the international financial community. 
Such reintegration takes many dimensions. One of the most important dimensions occurred on Wednesday, September 29th, when the IMF Executive Board approved emergency post-conflict assistance for Iraq. At one level, that approval reconfirmed and deepened Iraq's relations with the IMF. But in a broader sense, the decision of the executive board representing the IMF's 184 member countries marked an endorsement of the economic and financial path that Iraq has charted for itself. Today, I would like to talk to you about the specific economic initiatives and developments in Iraq that made it possible to conclude an assistance package with the IMF, and more broadly, are transforming my country, taking together the initiatives and reforms that make up Iraq's economic program constitute one of the main pillars of the new life and institutions that we are building in Iraq. I would also like to talk to you today about another crucial dimension to Iraqis' full reintegration in the international financial community. The conclusion of an international agreement on the reduction of Iraq's external debt. In particular, I would like to discuss why deep debt reduction is essential to achieving both the economic and broader political and security objectives to which Iraq and its partners are committed. To give you some a current a picture on our economy, I would say that the main features of Iraq's current economic picture include, you may be surprised to hear, a number of positive elements. A sound macroeconomic framework, robust economic activity, and a good start on a broad range of structural and legal reforms that are critical to making the transitional, the, the, the transition, sorry, from the centralized economy to an economy based on private ownership, open markets, transparency, and the rule of law. There are, of course, a number of very real economic problems and challenges. Chief among them are high unemployment, a large number of state-owned enterprises, and infrastructure that, despite improvements, is in need of further repair, and as I will discuss later, a very large overhang of foreign debts. These economic issues are in turn part of a broader picture that includes political and security challenges. We are in the midst of preparing for elections, which can be a continuous process and we are fighting every day against insurgents and foreign terrorists who seek to undermine everything we are trying to achieve. These challenges have not deterred us, however, from moving forward with our economic reform program, let me describe the main elements of that program. Nothing what we have achieved thus far and what remains to be done. Noting, sorry, noting what has been achieved so far and what remains to be done. In the macroeconomic field, one of the most important accomplishments in Iraq since the end of the conflict, and one you do not read about in the papers, is the stabilization of the economy inherited from Saddam regime and the establishment of a sound macroeconomic framework. Given the economic 
mismanagement of Saddam era, Iraq's post-war economy could have been characterized by a collapse of the currency, by hyperinflation and by widespread tensions, if not chaos, born of fears of an economic meltdown. Instead, Iraq enjoys overall macroeconomic stability, which is the basis on which all else having to do with the economy rests. Consumer prices have been broadly stable this year, and the exchange rate has remained largely unchanged in active trading. Thanks in part to this stable macroeconomic environment, growth is expected to be about 50% in 2004, despite the difficult security environment. The sound macro environment is the result of a number of crucial reforms and initiatives. In the monet monetary area, the introduction of a new currency has brought confidence and facilitated the day-to-day -day transactions of Iraq's 25 million citizens. A new central bank a new central bank law provides for the independence and accountability of the Central Bank of Iraq and prohibits the central bank from extending credits to the government. <coughs> I am happy to report that the central bank, which was once a part of the finance ministry, is no longer the lender of the first resort. Monetary policy has focused on maintaining price stability in the context of a stable exchange rate. The central bank conducts daily foreign exchange auctions to limit the impact on money growth from oil export earnings. New monetary policy tools are being created to give us more and better tailored options for managing liquidity, including a lender of last resort and overnight facilities. <coughs> Adjustments to reserve requirements and a table market. The Ministry of Finance recently introduced regular treasury bill auctions, and we intend to develop a secondary market that will facilitate open market operations by the central bank. This demonstrates that there is extensive domestic savings in Iraq, a factor fundamental to growth and investment. The T-bill market will also help banks manage their liquidity, which in turn will support much needed intermediation. The economic activity, <coughs> the main driver of Iraq's economic is of course oil production which constitutes more than 75% of total economic activity. By September of this year, oil production has risen to 2.4 million barrels per day, and exports were up to 1.7 million barrels per day, although production and export levels continue to fluctuate due, due to sabotage and deteriorated infrastructure. Oil production is expected to average slightly more than 2 million barrels a day in 2004 and exports about 1.5 million barrels. No oil economic activity has been recovering, driven mainly by commercial and reconstruction activities. Despite the security environment, retail commercial activity continues to be brisk, and there appears to be a revival in agriculture sector. The streets and bazaars are filled with all kinds of goods. Many of those goods are important, are imported, reflecting robust trade relations with Iraq's immediate neighbors 
and other members of the international community. Trade has been facilitated by a sweeping reform of Iraq's trade regime. Imports are subject to a single flat import duty of 5% and the creation of institution, institutions such as the Trade Bank of Iraq has spurred trade and helped support reconstruction efforts. To date, the Trade Bank of Iraq, which involved the participation of a consortium of international banks, has issued letters of credit with a total value of well over $1 billion to strengthen Iraq's integration in the international trade community. Iraq is actively pursuing membership in the World Trade Organization and recently achieved observer status. On the structural reforms, Iraq has taken some important steps to emerge from a legacy of statist controls, price distortions, and government ownership. Interest rates have been fully liberalized. A new foreign investors and allows for a new foreign direct investment law provides national treatment for foreign investors and allow foreign ownership in all sectors of the, of the economy except natural resources, real estate, and insurance. The banking sector has been the focus of much investor interest, both domestic and foreign, <coughs> thanks in part to the passage of modern commercial banking law in October of last year and the opening of the financial sector to foreign banks. Four foreign banks have been licensed to operate in Iraq and domestic entities have shown strong interest in applying for banking license. With the increase of banking activity, the central bank has taken steps to strengthen its ability to evaluate applications and to monitor and regulate banking operations. We have also taken steps to require commercial banks to strengthen their capital base. What's, going, what's coming ahead? The steps I have just described helped make it possible for the IMF's membership to provide emergency post-conflict assistance. The IMF support, as well as other assistance we are receiving from the international community, will in turn help us to deepen and strengthen the economic reform program we have undertaken. Let me describe the main things on the horizon, particularly in the areas of fiscal policy, further structural reforms, and debt relief. On the fiscal policy, achieving a substantial, a sustainable, achieving a sustainable fiscal position is one of my top priorities. High costs for reconstruction and security combined with fluctuating revenues from the oil sector make this a challenging task. Among my chief concerns is the heavy dependence of the economy and in turn the budget on the oil sector. Iraq must avoid falling into the trap of oil dependency and instead create conditions in which a diverse and vibrant economy can flourish. We have already implemented reforms to the tax code and to customs policy that will help make Iraq a more hospitable environment for the trade and business activity. Especially we have simplified and liberalized the trade regime. As I noted <coughs> earlier, there is now a flat 5% duty on imports and capped individual and corporate income tax 
taxes at between 3 and 15 percent. Our efforts to create conditions for growth have been matched by steps to keep expenditures at a level that Iraq, with assistance from the international community, can afford. We are making a special effort to keep recurrent expenditures in check in order to ensure fiscal balance in the coming years. In this regard, we are committed to limiting the wage and pension bill and eliminating of budget expenditures. We are also taking steps to strengthen the infrastructure of sound fiscal policy. The laws and management systems that underpin the budget. Increasing transparency is a crucial part of our effort. This year, for the first time in decades, the Ministry of Finance published its federal budget. This is a practice I intend to keep. We have also adopted a financial management law that establishes a framework based on international best practice for developing, executing, and reporting the annual budget. As part of our IMF program, we are implementing throughout the country a financial management information system and taking steps to ensure effective metering of oil production. Changing outdated systems and practices of budget formulation and execution as well as economic policy management more broadly will take time, but we are committed to this. Other further structural reforms, creating the conditions that support job cre creation, private sector-led growth, and fiscal sound soundness requires that Iraq push ahead with structural reforms. Two of the most important and politically <clears throat> difficult challenges are the unwind Iraq's energy and food subsidies. While ensuring support for the most needy and to reduce the presence of state-owned enterprises, Domestic prices for oil products are well below international and regional standards. Our goal is to bring domestic energy prices up to a level where costs are recovered. Towards that goal, by the end of this year, Iraq will reduce subsidies on a range of oil products, including gasoline. Regarding food subsidies, Iraq continues to operate a food rationing system as part of the social safety net. We intend to move from a food-based system to a cash distribution system that is targeted at the poor. Monetizing the ration system will support the revitalization of the agriculture sector and open new opportunities for the private sector while continuing to provide for the needs of the poorest sectors of society. We will also be analyzing the viability of state-owned enterprise, enterprises to determine how to deal with each entity. In the financial sector, we are focusing our efforts on adopting a plan for restructuring and streamlinking Iraq's state-owned banks. Iraq's two state-owned commercial banks, Rafidin and Rashid Bank, currently account for nearly 90% of total banking assets. And their extensive network of branches constitutes the main banking pres presence throughout the country. At the same time, <coughs> Iraq's private banking sector is enjoying a renaissance. As I noted earlier, both foreign and domestic entities have shown keen interest in obtaining licenses to operate in Iraq. 
it will be important to restructure the state-owned banks in a way that supports, that supports the continued development of a robust private banking sector. That concerning this important question of debt relief, I would like to include with some remarks on one of the most pressing issues facing Iraq. It is its staggering external debt burden. Deep reduction of Iraq's external debt is essential. Iraq's economy has great potential if it can be unchained from the constraints that hold it back. Some of those constraints are internal and to a greater or lesser extent within Iraq's control. The economic reforms that I have described will go a long way towards removing the burdens imposed by poor policies, outdated institutional practices, structural rigidities, and other legacy of Iraq's status past. But these reforms will not su suffice. In order for Iraq's economy to attract the kind of investment needed for sustained growth in order for Iraq's authorities to maintain a fiscal regime conductive to private sector activity and investment in human capital in order for the Iraqi people to achieve living standards that support political stability, virtually all of Iraq's debt overhang needs to be eliminated. I do not want to dwell on numbers or percentages, but the basic numbers tell a compelling story. Iraq's external debt, $125 billion, much of which was accumulated during the period of sanctions, represents almost six times Iraq's GDP. Six times, I repeat. Some have spoken of eliminating half or two-thirds of Iraq's external debt. That would leave a debt burden that is still multiple to our GDP. To service such a debt burden, Iraq's financial authorities would be forced to divert funding that is des desperately needed for investments in infrastructure, education, health care, and other reconstruction priorities and would be obliged to institute a tax regime that stifles private sector activity. I believe that part of the reason that some may be reluctant to provide deep debt reduction for Iraq is because of a misunderstanding about three living conditions in Iraq today. Some, perhaps remembering that Iraq was once one of the more prosperous countries in the Gulf, simply do not realize that Iraq's GDP per capita has fallen from $3,200 in 1980 to less than $1,000 a day today. Iraq's human indicators are on a par with some of the poorest countries on the world. In the year 2000, the infant mortality rate was estimated at 121 per 1,000 births, and adult illiteracy at approximately 60%. <clears throat> Housing standards are extremely poor, providing Iraq with a tra traditional debt treatment would be tantamount to condemning Iraq to years of poverty. Some finding it hard to believe that a country with vast oil reserves could be impoverished under any circumstances. Iraq does enjoy very significant oil reserves, but if Iraq cannot attract the investment capital needed to repair and upgrade its oil industry, 
then its reserves stay in the ground. Investors, especially those that need to commit capital for a significant period of time in order to see a real return on their investment, will not come to Iraq if there is a major debt overhang. These are the kinds of investors Iraq must attract if it is to transform its oil reserves into real economic assets and to restructure and privatize its state-owned enterprises. In closing, let emphasize that deep debt reduction is not only very important for Iraq, but will also pay returns many times over to the region and the world. An Iraq that enjoys robust and sustained economic growth, political stability, and greater integration with the international community is in everyone's interest. I look forward to continue working towards that goal and retain hope that the international community will continue to support Iraq in its efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, the minister has very graciously agreed to take some questions. I, I want to give him a word of warning. You know, in America, people don't want to tell your story. They don't want to tell a story about market reform, and they don't want to tell a story about optimism, and they don't want to tell a story about hope for the future. They want to tell a story about Iraqis who miss the stability of Saddam Hussein, who really enjoyed life, who really thought that things were a lot better. And those are the stories that we read in the press here every day. So I want you to remember, as you talk to these people, that your responsibility is to tell a different story if, in fact, that is correct. <laughs> so with that, we're going to turn to questions from the audience. Before taking questions, yes. can I brief my friends about the security situation? Please, absolutely. I'm sure that they would be very interested. Is it interesting to? Yes. Oh. <clears throat> well, I, since I. I came to the States, really. I, am, I was in Baghdad more optimistic than reading in the press here, really. Uh, uh, it seems that you, you, you are getting really a certain virtual reality, not the real one, a one-sided reality. There are bad things in Iraq. We don't have uh, a good situation, that's right. But we had wars before, before Saddam Hussein, and even last year. From all points of, views, of view, situation, situation was worse, economically, politically, ethnically, and in the security issue. Iraq, and I will leave uh, the other, our friends, the, the multinational forces, but I am talking about Iraq. The annual casualty in Iraq were counted by 10,000 each year in the time of Saddam Hussein. Today, it is much less than before. Don't forget that people were tortured, killed, assassinated, sent to wars, massive uh, graves, etc. So we were losing in Iraq more people than we are losing now, today. Don't forget that Iraq had three wars during 20 years. Four generations lived in the period of Saddam Hussein. So it wouldn't be easy it wouldn't be rational to see that things will go smoothly after the overthrow of Saddam Hussein. That regime accumulated so many bad things, conflictual things, disputes, but things are going much better than before. It's not because I am a minister talking to you about that, 
but go to Iraq and see what, what, what's going on. Our markets, really we have a jam of traffic. Uh, uh, markets are full with goods, as I, as I said. Uh, people spend uh, up to, to midnight uh, their time in the restaurants and, and cafes. Uh, don't, don't, don't take it as a one-sided picture, as if fighting is going just behind my window or my door. That's not uh, the reality in Iraq. For, for decades, the country was governed by a minority, a dictatorship. Now it's governed by a plural, multi-diverse political forces and independent personalities. Sunnis, Shias, Arabs, Kurds, Turkmen, Assyrians, etc. Islamists, secular. So it's not easy to, 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 to see things. Now we have almost 250 newspapers without counting the channels and the TVs. They are reporting. That's why you, are, you see some, some, some of those <laughs> really uh, pictures that, that would give you a, a one-sided vision. 250 newspapers. Tens of political parties are working in Iraq. The political process is going on. Security is getting better since the transfer of sovereignty. Iraqis are taking security more and more in their hands. The question of Najaf was resolved more or less, well, peacefully. There were fighting before. This secured security to, the, to all the south. The North Kurdistan is in a peaceful <coughs> situation. Don't th take the idea that uh, what they call the Sunni triangle is the Sunni population. The majority of Arab Sunnis live in Baghdad, in Mosul, in Diyala, and in other parts of Iraq. They are not all in Fallujah. Still, we are trying to propose political arrangements. And it's working. Now in Sadr city, I, I spoke today with Baghdad and they are telling me that there is a political uh, settlement in the Sadr city where a few hundred people are fighting there, still fighting there. Samarra had been taken back to the government and the situation is stable. We will deal with Fallujah. We are ha taking contact with them, but the political process is, is really uh, progressing. All of the main political forces are within. The violence, insurgence, and terrorism is really uh, being defeated. That's why they are so brutal. They are few in numbers. They have to use brutal methods beheading people, taking them, kidnapping them, and taking them hostages to make the front page and the main uh, news and, and TVs. So really, I was here when I came to the States. I became pessimistic. I came with optimism, knowing my country. <laughs> and, 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 and please look after the news. Don't look at the, at the news itself as if it is reality. Behind those news there, there is another reality you have to see. Repeating situation is not perfect, but it is progressing in the good sense. And I think we will have good elections next year. And this political process will be victorious. Thank you. If I can ask our questioners to identify themselves, wait for the microphone, and ask a question. Don't make a statement, please. Um, uh, this young lady in the green. Um, Uh, my name is Ayad Batrawi, uh, my first question to you is, have you met with any of the Kuwaiti finance ministers or anyone of the Kuwaiti finance leaders regarding debt relief with Kuwait? Yes. <coughs> and can you please then tell me some of the discussions you've had in agreements? Yes, we, we sent, we had many contacts with our brothers Kuwaitis. And uh, we sent uh, a technical team 
to Kuwait uh, just uh, two, three weeks uh, ago. And they reported me that they had done uh, very good work there. Uh, we met here with the Kuwaiti delegation. We had a very good conversation. And they showed their willingness to assist Iraq uh, in its debt uh, issue. Thank you. Jim Hoagland, Washington Post. Mr. Minister, first of all, thank you for being here and thank you for your uh, exposition this morning, which I think did give us new insight into what's going on in Iraq. I wonder if I could ask you a three-part uh, question having to do primarily with trade, which you said is now uh, quite robust in Iraq. Uh, could you tell us which of your neighboring countries uh, are most active in terms of trade, what the balances and imbalances are? And what kind of long-term perspective does this give for relations with your neighboring countries, such as Jordan, Iran, and all of the others? Uh, secondly, you mentioned that uh, four foreign banks are now licensed to operate. What countries are they from? And finally, sir, there's much discussion now of a conference, an international conference, regional conference, uh, in November. Uh, I wonder how you see the economic component of that conference, how important uh, the economic situation in Iraq should be to that conference, and ideally, what you would like that conference to do. Thank you for your questions. <coughs> uh, the first one was about uh, trade. Trade with your neighbors. Yes. We can see a lot of uh, Turkish goods from Emirates, from Iran, from Jordan, from the Saudians, coming from the Saudians. Uh, of course, there are some Asian products coming through Dubai and uh, via certain uh, countries. Uh, a little bit from Europe and from the States. So it's mostly Mike, and let's see how that works. Oh, it's back. <coughs> so that was the, the first question. The second one, the, the, the banks comes from Kuwait, uh, Jordan, Aziz, correct me if I am wrong. Uh, from Britain. Yes. So Britain, uh, Kuwait, Egyptian has, has something to do with that also, Americans, and, and uh, Jordanian. And finally, the upcoming conference? Of Tokyo. Tokyo conference? No, the Cairo conference uh, in November. OK, this is a regional conference that Dr. Alawi, yes. Uh, I wonder it was an economical one. I think it's, it's uh, all issues, security, uh, political issue, and of course, economy. We think this is a very important conference if we can really achieve it. Uh, some of our economical and political problems in Iraq are regional ones, and of course, international also. We have internal problems. That's why we, <coughs> we were working on a conference where all the regional players with international ones, including uh, the Gulf states, uh, the Arab League, the Islamic organization, they can participate in a way to di dialogue, exchange views, and uh, have a common policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iraq. That is our purpose. 
because we, we, we see that we don't want to be in the crossfire of neighbors and, 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 and uh, uh, certain uh, conflicts that uh, shouldn't be taking, take place in Iraq. That's our intention and to have a common policy uh, of all our neighbors Whenever we go and, and ask them, they all say we want to assist Iraq, we want stability in Iraq, we want to reconstruct Iraq. That's why it, there is a need to, to bring all those people together with the international community, with, with the main uh, international uh, nations such as the United States, United Kingdom, France, and Russia, etc. That's why we think it's a very important conference if we can do it. Yes. Sorry. I'm Desmond Lochman from the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Minister, for a very clear and informative presentation. You mentioned that you would like to see Iraq reduce its dependence on the oil sector over the long term. Uh, my question to you is, how do you see the management of oil reserves and the exchange rate uh, in that context? And in particular, do you have in mind anything along the lines that the Norwegians did uh, to prevent the economy from suffering from uh, what's called the Dutch disease, you know, where the exchange rate goes too high and gets moved around by fluctuations in oil prices? Okay. Well, as you know, Iraq is, uh, is very rich in, in, in other resources. Uh, agriculture, uh, sulfur, uh, gas, uh, although gas is considered in the same uh, sector. Um, anyway, Iraq, I think, uh, has the potentiality to diverse it, its resources. Uh, we have <coughs> today in Iraq a Supreme Council to put forward strategies in the oil industry. We are discussing many issues. And uh, uh, one of the ideas is that a national company should, should return on uh, really an economical and marketing uh, basis to work on the oil uh, issue, which is not the case today. It's all centralized and it's sustained. Uh, the Ministry of, of Oil uh, uh, controls all the issue of oil. So it will be, uh, there will be many national, a main national uh, uh, company, oil company, but with uh, other national companies in Iraq. Uh, <coughs> downstream, we are thinking of, of accepting some investments in, in, in the oil industry. Uh, uh, on the exchange, I didn't understand the question about the exchange. Which, which exchange rate? Uh, just a, go. The country's exchange rate. Yes, okay, inflation and exchange rate. Uh, well, we are trying to, to, to float our currency. It's, it's not a fixed exchange rate. It's a floating one, but it is stabilized. It's today uh, 1460, the exchange rate, 1460 uh, dinar for each uh, dollar, uh, and it's stable. And that's a very important uh, issue. Uh, we are looking really carefully concerning the question of inflation. But some of us see that let inflation come. That means that we finished with the, with, with, with the, the security issue. Let inflation come. That means investment is, is in the country. Let inflation come. That means activity is going on. Then it's easier to deal with inflation than to deal with terrorists and insurgents. This is an issue, of course. It's an important one. But I cannot predict today what measures we are going to take next year, you see. But inflation is a question that uh, we will face when all investments, internal and external ones, uh, will come. 
but uh, this is something that we are welcoming really for investments and, and activities. And uh, this is one of the symptoms of, of our economies today. Thank you, uh, Andrew Balls from the Financial Times. Um, just wanted to ask, um, you've, you've outlined the, um, the positive outlook for Iraq um, with, with needed in, uh, investment in the country. In terms of debt negotiations, I just wanted to ask why the focus was on a full write-off now and why the focus isn't more on restructuring the debt so as to have no payments in the next several years during a period of growth but then have payments at a later date. Uh, the funds analysis says that um, a broad range of about two-thirds to up to 95% of debt relief is going to be needed uh, in order for long-term sustainability. What's wrong with proposals whereby you, um, you shift the burden off into the future and give a time to, to see what the macro variables, uh, variables are going to be in that analysis? Well, <clears throat> my first reaction is that for generations, I Iraq lived under an unknown situation. Uh, we don't want to leave the coming generations to unknown factors. And uh, uh, I think the same thing will be re requested from the investors. Uh, if we leave uh, an unknown future, that the death question will be settled within three or five years, and I don't think we will have a lot of investors coming to Iraq. Uh, that's why we are looking for a real deal in coming before the, the end of this year. And uh, a real reduction, we call it major, deep, uh, uh, a high reduction, whatever, uh, would give the idea that this reduction should, should be uh, uh, in a way that the country uh, would be an, in a sustainable situation. Otherwise, uh, it could not honor its engagement. Uh, we should have a one deal, although we can look forward to see how we are going to deal with either staging or, or phasing the way to do it. But we need certain clear deal coming before the end of this year. And uh, for example, <coughs> we are arguing that most of the debt with the Paris Club creditors are late interests. Those late interests were accumulated because of sanctions, because of an international resolution taken by the Security Council. Even if Iraq was willing to pay, he couldn't do so. There was an international uh, resolution, so most, about $19 billion were, is considered as, as late uh, interest, and we are asking for ca whole cancellation of this debt. Uh, we, we, we cannot leave burdens on the Iraqi economy and at the same time reconstruct the country, including the oil industry. Uh, we are arguing with our friends and, and partners that, look, if, if Iraq can return back to, the, to its oil markets, what are the positive factors it will apport to the whole world economy? I think if Iraq can return back, there will be a push downward to incline prices, and it will be in the benefit of all. Uh, economical uh, in, in, the, in the world economy. So uh, we have an argument there. We don't want people to put percentages, numbers, half, two third, etc. Let that, let them define to us what is the sustainable uh, situation in Iraq. The IMF ha has issued uh, a DSA uh, that sustainability analyzes, and it shows. The, how much Iraq can, can take of debts. And we want, if others are arguing this, this, this analysis, to show us how, why they are putting such numbers. That's why we went to the IMF, we went 
uh, working on, on such uh, DSA uh, to provide the basis for negotiations. John Ivinator, the Air uh, CNO Resources, sorry, Excellency. Um, back to oil. Uh, we've been hearing stories, yes or no, that the South is talking about getting a deal like the North in terms of uh, not getting enough attention economically in terms of rebuilding, and that they may create a structure, as the North has set up a structure, uh, to have more autonomy vis-a-vis -vis control of the resources. How is the integration of the overall economy with regard to oil resources, bringing the north, making sure it's part of the structure, the south part of the structure, how are those discussions going, and is there any credibility to this, to this claim that the three southern provinces are talking about setting up a more autonomous structure? Thank you. This is an economical or political question? Both. Are there any differences? No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I think they are integrating well. Uh, on the country, the, 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 the North Kurdistan was apart from the central government for, for a decade. Now it's integrated. You have uh, uh, a foreign ministry who is a Kurd, a vice president who is a Kurd, a deputy prime minister uh, who is Kurd. Many ministers, they are Kurd, and they are very active in the government. They are not puppets, as was the, the situation in Saddam's time. And economically also, they are integrating uh, the budget, everything is, 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 had been integrated gradually, not completely. Concerning the South, we have the TAL, the law to administer the state of Iraq. And uh, it should restructure the provinces in a way that federalism could become a reality in Iraq, not only the, the Kurds in their area, then the central government with the other areas. There should be uh, a certain restructuring process of some provinces to have bigger entities and a federal state. will be our last question. Uh, I'm Kathy Ward with the International Crisis Group. Um, one of the questions, I, issues that you've touched on, and again, when we talk about sort of gloom and doom reporting here in the United States, is the issues of unemployment and jobs and job creation. And I'm wondering if you could, you know, drawing on what you've already said, talk a little bit more specifically about what you're seeing currently on the ground in terms of employment and what some of your projections are for the coming year to two years. Thank you. <clears throat> we don't have statistics. For decades, Iraq didn't have any statistics. As I said, even we didn't have a real budget. Unemployment was estimated at almost 60% in 2003. We think, I am not sure, we think that it is now between 20 and 30%. Uh, empirically, empirically, if we go where uh, uh, untrained workers would wait for a pattern for uh, an employer to, 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 to take them for a day. We don't see a lot of people staying at the end of, of the day. By noon, no one is there. Salaries went up to eight and 10,000 for unskilled worker. It, uh, that was the, a, salary of, uh, a monthly salary. This is a daily salary I, I'm, I'm talking about, you see. Uh, yes, dinars, of course, not dollars. <laughs> you see, so empirically speaking, uh, I think uh, economical situation is getting much better. You know, we, we raised salaries about 20, 30 folds in uh, an administration. So there is a lot of spending. That's why commercial life is, is, uh, is, is getting much better than, than, than before. And unemployment really uh, is getting back. Do you have any, she asked, do you have any projections for the next year or the following year? Well, we are working on small and medium enterprises. This is a priority uh, to, to 
absorb as much as unemployment as we can. Uh, we, 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 we discussed with the IMF and World Bank and other, other institutions, even in the, with our <coughs> neighbors, uh, our policies concerning those small and medium enterprises as a way to promote economy from one side and to, to face unemployment on the other side. Thank you. Mr. Minister, you've been very generous with your time. And, you were uh, very generous with me. We're very grateful for your being here. Good luck. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you.